Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. Today we are considering H-128, an act relating to limiting criminal defenses based on victim identity. And we are joined by uh, two of the lead sponsors of the bill. And uh, before we do a walkthrough with council, I'd really like to hear from the um, from the sponsors. And uh, thank you both so much for being here. And um, Representative Small, how about if I if we uh, start with you, please. Wonderful. And thank you so much, Madam Chair and committee for hearing testimony on H-128. Um, this bill aims to track and prevent the use of identity-based defenses for crimes here in the state of Vermont. And the question that comes up most often is, what does the data look like for transgender and gender nonconforming, as well as just LGBTQIA Vermonters overall when it comes to acts of violence? And honestly, we are not tracking this data on a statewide level. And so it is currently housed within the nonprofit realm. More specifically, uh, looking forward to later testimony from the interim director of the anti-violence program at Pride Center of Vermont, who can touch on some of the statistics that we are seeing on a community level around violence. But nationally, we understand that there is an epidemic of targeted violence towards transgender and gender nonconforming people. For the past four years, we've seen an increase in the murder of transgender people. And I think what is most, um, the hardest piece to hear is that each year for the past four years has been determined the deadliest year for transgender and gender nonconforming people here in the United States. And also looking at the intersection of identities, we know that the statistics are even worse for Latinx and black transgender women. Uh, what we know is that black transgender women have a life expectancy here in the United States of 38 years, not because of any health impacts or conditions, but because of the violence that they have faced and will continue to face unless we put measures in place. So by allowing the gay trans panic defense to be used in our state, what we're ultimately doing is undervaluing, undermining, and threatening the existence of our beautifully diverse LGBTQIA plus community. And so I ask for this committee to be proactive on this and not wait for the next tragedy to strike for us to take this issue up. And again, I'm grateful for your work in hearing testimony here today. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Representative Cordes, I'd like to add a few words. Thank you so much for taking this, this bill up. And uh, I would add, the hope that this committee will will dig uh, deep into, um, in particular, the reporting issue, uh, Section C. Um, as Representative Small said, we are not collecting this data, so we don't know um, when there have been cases, how many cases, um, and. I'm grateful to see the, the list of witnesses you have lined up um, to help get at what, who should do the reporting, who should gather the information, what information, um, if we could in your committee gather much more clarity about section C um, in a manner that's uh, most useful and uh, respectful. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, you, both of you, would you be willing to take questions from committee members if they have them at this point? Okay. Great. Does anybody have any questions? No. No. Okay, all right, well, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I believe, yes, great. Um, Attorney Bryn Hare is here, Legislative Council, and I'd like to start with a walkthrough of the bill, please. I hope um, folks have a copy of it on our website. Good afternoon. Good to see you, Bryn. Good afternoon, committee. For the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council, here to walk through H-128. Um, I'm sorry I missed uh, the first couple of witnesses. Um, hopefully I won't be too repetitive here in my walkthrough. <clears throat> so section one of the bill on page two, I presume everybody has it up somewhere and I don't need to share my screen. 
Okay, I'll just keep going then. So section one adds um, a new section of law to the pleadings and proof subchapter of the pleadings and trial chapter of Title 13. And essentially what it does is it bars the use of a particular kind of uh, defense. So um, subdivision A provides that um, evidence of a defendant's discovery of, knowledge about, or the potential disclosure of a crime victim's actual or perceived sexual orientation or gender identity um, cannot be used in a criminal offense as a defense to uh, the defendant's criminal conduct or to establish a finding that defendant suffered from diminished capacity, which I'll talk about in just a moment, or to justify defendant's use of force against another person. So diminished capacity, um, essentially what that means, and we can talk a lot, we can talk about this at the end or talk about it now, but it may make sense to talk about it here. Um, as the committee knows, um, it's the prosecution's burden. They have the evidentiary duty to establish each element of a crime. Um, and that includes the element of the mental state. Um, as you know, many crimes have a mental state requirement and it's the burden on the prosecution to prove that mental state requirement beyond a reasonable doubt. <clears throat> so evidence of diminished capacity is relevant to proving the existence of some kind of obstacle to the presence of a state of mind, which is an element of a crime. So for example, um, a, a good way to think about it is to think about the insanity defense. There's a little bit of overlap here between diminished capacity and the insanity defense. So an insanity, like uh, the committee knows that an, an insanity defense is um, essentially a total bar to criminal culpability. So evidence of diminished capacity differs from an insanity defense in that it is legally um, applicable to lesser um, disabilities. So it operates to reduce the degree of an offense rather than excuse the commission of the offense. Does that make sense? I'm just gonna kind of scan faces here. Okay. So, um, it specifically provides that that kind of evidence cannot be used to establish some type of diminished capacity on the part of the defendant, <clears throat> which the, a defense counsel could put forward to sort of interrupt um, the prosecutor's um, establishment of the mental state required as, a, as an element of a crime. So I'm going to move on to subsection B. Um, this provides that any romantic or sexual advance by a person that is not violent um, or the defendant's perception or belief, even if it's not accurate, of the gender or gender identity or sexual orientation of a victim, neither of those things can be used to mitigate the severity of an offense. And then lastly, subdivision C, um, as, as mentioned by the sponsors, um, requires some data collection uh, done by the attorney general. So it provides that annually, beginning on January 1st next year and annually every year thereafter, the attorney general is directed to provide some data to the standing committees, the standing judiciary committees, detailing any criminal prosecutions um, that were crimes that were motivated by the victim's gender, gender identity or expression or sexual orientation. And that report has to specifically provide some demographic information about both the dem, uh, defendants and the victims, including their age, ethnicity, race, and gender. And that's it, the bill takes effect on passage. Great, thank you, Bryn. Committee, questions? Ken. Hi, um, line 11, Will you just um, help me understand that a little bit more, please? Sure. Um, I presume that you're talking about the that first line, a nonviolent romantic or sexual advance by a crime victim. Yeah. So I think that kind of means just what it says, like some romantic or sexual overture by a person. Um, that winds up being a crime victim that is not violent in nature. So it's not a forceful or, um, or a violent overture, but um, rather just a romantic gesture or a sexual gesture towards another. 
Is that helpful? No, I'm lost on that one. Um, maybe I'll figure it out as, as we go. I probably jumped too fast on that. That's okay. We'll figure it out. Thank you. Sure. So I would just point out that the, the way that subsection B is phrased, there's two um, separate things that cannot be used to mitigate the severity of an offense. There's that first thing. So evidence of a crime victim's romantic gesture towards the defendant can't be used um, to mitigate the severity of, offense, of an offense. And then also the other, which is the defendant's perception or belief of the gender, gender identity or sexual orientation of a crime victim also can't be used as evidence to mitigate the severity of an offense. So the way it's written might, um, might be a little confusing. Hope that helps. Yeah, no, thank you. I think, I think that was helpful. Uh, Selena and then Kate. Um, hi, and apologies if I missed this earlier. This is a question, I guess, for Bryn or, or the um, sponsors of the bill, but it's my understanding that this um, legislation has been enacted in a number of other states, and I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit of, about what we know about you know, how many other states or, and then which some examples of jurisdictions where it's been enacted for some time. Representative Small, I have some of the list in front of me. You want me to take that? Uh, go right ahead, Representative Cortez. So in alphabetical order, uh, California enacted in 2014 by amending the statutory definition of voluntary manslaughter. Um, Colorado in 2020, SB 20-221 20 enacted. Um, a bill with similar language and created a protective hearing if a party claims that such evidence is relevant and wants to use it in a criminal case. Connecticut, 2019, Delaware, DC have, um, I don't have the details for those. Um, Hawaii in 2019 enacted a bill, Illinois, 2017, Maine, in Nevada, 2019, New Jersey, 2020, New York, 2019. Not sure if that one was enacted. The last reference I saw was um, passage through the Senate. Uh, Rhode Island, 2018, Washington State enacted HB 1687 in 2020. That's very helpful. Thank you. Appreciate it. That. that was a, that was a, a very comprehensive <laughs> answer to my question. Thanks. For and I can time. share that uh, sheet with the committee. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate that. Great. Uh, Kate. Yeah, thanks. Um, Brenna, wasn't, I, I know you just explained this, but I'm wondering if you can just, if you don't mind going back and explaining it again, the clarification around um, line eight. Uh, so it shall not be used to establish a finding that defendants suffered from diminished capacity. Can you just, can you just reiterate again? Sort of what the de definition of diminished capacity is. Sure. <clears throat> so diminished capacity, um, evidence of diminished capacity uh, is relevant to proving the existence of some kind of obstacle to the presence of a particular state of mind, um, which is which is relevant because most crimes have the element, a state of mind element. For example, premeditation is one that you think of quite frequently. So any evidence that um, the defense puts forward is used as an obstacle to the prosecution being able to prove, um, to put on their case and prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant had that particular state of mind that's an element of the crime. So I kind of compared it a little bit to the insanity defense, but it is different from the insanity defense because as the insanity defense is a complete bar um, to criminal culpability, um, evidence of diminished capacity operates to reduce the degree of an offense rather than to excuse um, the criminal nature of the crime. So um, for example, to reduce um, a, an aggravated assault down to a regular assault, for example. Thank you, that's helpful. Okay, uh, Martin. So um, Bryn, how, how if at all does this 
bill intersect with the hate crime, uh, hate motivated crimes bill? I guess particularly, I guess I'm looking at the subsection C, which is talking about prosecutions of crimes committed that were motivated by the victim's gender. And uh, that's, isn't that covered in the hate crimes as far as, well, it's, except that it's maliciously motivated, includes gender identity. Um, I, I don't know if those intersect at all. I mean, I know this one's more of a, about a defense and the other one's more about prosecution, but that subsection C does. Right, say, with respect to the data collection? Yes. Yeah, I do think that there's some overlap there, um, and it and you may and I think it may encompass more than what's covered by the hate motivated crimes um, statute, uh, just based on the language that exists in that statute currently. Um, but we can also dive into that and and make sure it encompasses both. Yeah, and I guess this is more of a question for the sponsors, and it, I'll just throw that out there that this might be a vehicle or an opportunity to get rid of the uh, uh, adverb maliciously in the uh, hate motivated crimes, which talks about being able to prosecute a crime if it was maliciously motivated by the victims, uh, perceived race, et cetera, including gender identity. But that's for another day. <laughs> but I'll throw that out there just for folks to ponder. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Anybody else have questions for, for Bryn in terms of understanding the language of the bill? I think, Martin, I think your hand is up from before, so I assume you're all set right. Okay, great. Okay, well, great. Well, then we will turn to our witnesses. Um, I am going to go a little bit out of order. I also want to do note that um, Bo Yang has uh, submitted written testimony or she will. She had a, a scheduling conflict, so that's why she's not with us in person today. Um, and I'd like to start with Brenda Churchill. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and uh, well, thank you. Um, and I thank Madam Chairman and the committee members for inviting me to testify this afternoon. Yeah. My name for the record is Brenda Churchill. I'm the co-liaison uh, to the State House for the LGBTQ Alliance of Vermont. Uh, today I will speak briefly to the Alliance's work to forward the intent of this bill over the last four years and how I have been affected by events during that time. When I first came to the Vermont State House, my co-liaison, Keith Ghostland, and I met with most of the top legislator, legislators and leaders here, including in that was a stop at the Attorney General's office. Um, one part of our discussion at that time was uh, about a recently passed legislation in another state concerning a gay panic defense law. It may have been one of the ones that Mari just mentioned. Uh, in any case, it was news and something that caused folks in our LGBTQIA community to reach out to the Alliance and ask questions of me like, what is, what is on the books for Vermont to keep this from happening and what are you doing to keep us safe? In my meetings with both uh, Attorney General Donovan and Governor Scott, I was asked the same question. You, uh, have you seen a rise in bias incidences or hate towards, LGBT, towards the LGBTQ community? And remember, this was shortly after uh, inauguration in 2017. At the time I said nothing seemed to be on the radar and that I felt safe in Vermont. Run that forward to the next four years with the federal administration bent on removing hard fought rights for all marginalized communities, my answer has changed. First, a ban on transgender people serving in our military is one of the first actions that opened a wound that began to divide a part of my family from the rest of the world. Allowing discrimination based on sexuality and gender for religious purposes showed clearly that something had taken a drastic turn. From white supremacists in Burlington City Hall Park to a candidate for governor that received credible personal threats weekly, sometimes daily, to a simple story hour that garnered hate speech in our towns, the unleashing of bias on gender and sexuality from the top down was clear. The safety of our community was at risk and continues to be, prompting me to say I no longer feel safe in the Green Mountain State. 
Legal statutes don't always mean social change and acceptance. Over the past four years, there's been a validation for exclusion and an increasing lack of federal protections. We need Vermont to take the lead again and protect our vulnerable citizens. Until we regain what we have lost on the federal level, Vermont needs to step up. My quote, Vermont is a state that has often shown the rest of the United States where to go and how to get there has never been more important than it is today. I support this bill and urge this committee to move it to the next level by supporting those of us who represent the LGBTQ plus community. Thank you. And uh, if anybody has any questions. Great. Right. Thank you so much, Brenda. I appreciate your your testimony and your and your leadership. It's good to see you. Uh, not seeing any hands. I'll give folks a minute. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you. Thank you again. Uh, okay, um, came from the Defender General's office, please. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, hi. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll find the buttons. Uh, good afternoon. This is Rebecca Turner for the record uh, for the Office of the Defender General. And thank you for having uh, me to come in and share our position on this bill. Um, and it is uh, our position that we oppose this, um, this bill. Uh, because it categorically limits um, the constitutional right of all accused persons to present a defense. But before I go into the specific reasons why we oppose it for those reasons, uh, I just wanted to remind um, the committee that the people we serve, our clients, our clients are comprised of every conceivable gender identity and sexual orientation. And so I come with that uh, in mind in terms of these interests of all of our clients. Again, I just want to bear repeating that all of these clients um, uh, come and have every uh, gender identity and sexual orientation. And so why we oppose this bill is that criminal trials are already governed by well-established longstanding rules of evidence. Um, and these rules of evidence balance the, um, the admissibility of relevant, um, relevant facts to be presented at trial against undue prejudice and um, balanced as well with the constitutional rights of the accused in, in every case. The, the defenses at issue in this case Again, there is no formal, um, formally considered gay panic defense, right? The way that the defenses have been introduced here essentially establish a categorical ban on defenses like diminished capacity, on self-defense, on provocation or heat of uh, passion defenses, um, insanity, uh, and and this categorical ban isn't necessary. Uh, well, it, it, would be, it would affect all of these defenses, despite the fact that these defenses have separate standards in and of themselves. Uh, it isn't that a defendant can go in and just say, we invoke the self-defense. Uh, we invoke diminished capacity or insanity, right? Uh, instead, to be able to invoke, uh, attorneys for the defendants have to present the individual pieces to meet each of those standards. And it's subject to rigorous adversarial challenges from the prosecutor. Uh, the judge then examines those arguments and the pieces and the evidence and then determines whether they meet these high standards. Only then is this evidence allowed to come into trial. I think that what's critical for the committee to understand is that while I understand the intentions are well motivated. Um, a, I think the the effect is to um, essentially presume that judges 
um, are incapable of being able to follow the, the rules and standards that govern the admission of this evidence. Um, again, it's not just that you want that a defendant seeks to have this statement come into evidence and that's it. Uh, they have to prove that this warrants uh, admissibility um, to come in. I think that denying jurors the ability to have before them all of relevant admissible evidence to a case almost reflects an underestimation of their capabilities um, to warrant and follow the instructions given by the judge on how to consider that evidence and to consider it in an unbiased way. I also think that uh, the effect of prohibiting this kind of um, evidence to come into a trial, even if it is offensive, um, disturbing, hateful, to keep that otherwise relevant and admissible evidence that is critical for a constitutional uh, right to present a defense for an accused, to keep it out, is to effectively um, suppress the, 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 the surfacing of these biases um, and not have it be subject to the adversarial process. And I'm not sure that furthers the interests here that are trying to be achieved. So I think that really what, what is sweeping about the language of this bill is that it is affecting all. And, and again, the question is why, or why do we need that here? My understanding is that there hasn't been a case uh, that I can recall, uh, and perhaps someone can, can share in Vermont where this has been an issue. So again, I understand that there are concerns, real concerns, but any time that there is an attempt to tinker with the fundamental principles of, of a criminal trial, and this one goes to the heart of it, which is the right to present a defense. This is a constitutional right to present a defense. And this law would impact all accused. Um, if there are any questions, I'll take a pause here. Uh, Martin, go ahead. And then Selena. And um, I have questions to maybe more so for Bryn, but we'll see if Martin and Selena bring any of those up. Go ahead. Yeah, a couple questions. I, I guess one is, um, so a situation where somebody uh, ass assaults somebody, use that as an example, and it's because the person perceived, you know, the defendant, um, the assaulter, uh, the defendant perceived the, the subject to be of a, a different gender that upsets the defendant. Uh, and, and actually assaults the person because of that. So I don't understand why we can say you're not allowed to use that as a defense when really at the same time we could be prosecuting the person under the hate crime, you know, we, you know that we could use the hate crime as an enhancement for, for the penalty. So I guess I'm not sure, uh, Rebecca, how those two things work together, if you could... Yes, no, and, and I appreciate your question. I, and I heard you ask it earlier. Uh, the sentencing enhancement, uh, and, and actually the hate crime statute that you're talking about is a sentencing enhancement statute. Right, right. And so it targets uh, certain crimes that are motivated, right, by, by, cer by certain animus towards certain groups. And, 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 um, and this would be captured in that. Uh, the, the difference, the significant difference is that that is a sentencing enhancement. So it's outside of the main prosecu prosecution, the main trial, right? It's, it's uh, been determined to be an aggregate, aggregate, aggregating factor. And you're right, that does, I think, ha it's already been addressed by this legislature by the hate crime statute. Uh, what this is and is significantly different Right? And this is where the serious constitutional uh, implications come in and, and directly undermine the rights of the accused 
is that we're getting to the heart of the defense, right? The right to present a defense. Whereas the hate crime statute is getting to the sentencing enhancements. Um, again, though, if, if your question is, is ha has this been covered and been addressed? Yes, I think that is how this legislature has and does treat these types of offenses differently. Uh, those that involve these hate, certain hate motivated crimes. Well, I guess I'm still a little confused because these, it seems to be con contradictory somewhat that, uh, so a defendant can raise that, well, I was motivated because of uh, this person was transgender. Uh, well, the prosecution should take that and, and because the prosecution, yes, it's, it's not, it's, it's a sentencing enhancement, but it's still part of the trial. It's still something the prosecution has to prove uh, that the underlying offense was due to the motivation. Uh, so it, it seems odd that, I don't know, I, I see, well, I guess I, what I'm saying is it seems a little odd that uh, somebody would raise this as a defense in the first instance because that immediately marches you into a potential sentencing enhancement. I, I have to yeah. think through a little bit more. But. No, no, and, 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 and you're right. I think that, that uh, there is a reason why I haven't seen this uh, occurring in the transcripts and the cases, right? There are a lot of strategy reasons why this should, this is not used uh, and brought up even if assuming it is a fact uh, involved in the case, right? There are other implications involved and risks, but ultimately whether or not it's relevant, whether or not it's appropriate in a certain case, whether the prosecution wants to bring in, uh, whether it is a factor to fully understand what was going on, um, to to motivate or explain what was gone, what what, what happened. Um, are the calls of a the defendant right, and that goes to the fundamental right to not just present but to to decide right to decide what evidence uh, and what theory of defense to present. Uh, it's up to the judge to determine whether that theory is adequately supported by the evidence needed, the threshold uh, evidence uh, applying the guiding uh, rules. And again, the judge decides that not in a vacuum, but after the prosecution gets to make his case or her case that it doesn't need it. So again, there are built in checks and balances all along the way. Uh, and in the end, I think really the proof is in the pudding that we can't, we, this is not a problem here in Vermont. Um, before, and I think it's not, I think that uh, hearing what's been happening in other states is interesting as a point of, of, of fact, if nothing else, and certainly a reflection of, of how serious, um, how serious hate motivated crimes are, how we don't want to tolerate them. Of course not. That's not, that's not what the Office of the Defender General's position should be collapsed into, right? Instead, what I think, and I think it's also important that this, this law would affect um, clients, defendants, accused of crimes from marginalized communities. So just one, uh, so when you said constitutional right to defense, is that federal constitution or state constitution? Both, both. Have, have any of these other states uh, had a cha uh, challenge, constitutional challenge that you know of? You know, I'm not sure it's had enough time. I understand these laws are fairly new. For sure, I mean, and I don't know if they have gone all the way through to the um, appellate courts. Frankly, I don't. I don't believe I heard um, the witnesses before, and I'm not aware that there is a federal version challenge. So I don't think there's there was anything there, um, and I'm not aware of how far if any any challenges have gone in the other state jurisdictions. Um, Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, I just want to follow up on that and then Selena, I'll get to uh, you. Yeah, Martin, I had the same question and Bryn, um, perhaps you can please look into um, other states, whether or not there have been challenges. And also curious if our language here, if it's um, based on um, one of the other states or a combination of the other states. Uh, and if you, have, if you have those answers now, great. If not, if you could get back to us. Yeah, I can. Um... I'll certainly look into whether or not there's been a constitutional challenge in one of the other states that's enacted um, a similar 
prohibition on this kind of defense. Um, and yes, it was modeled. I think that it's not, it, it was modeled after the Colorado um, legislation, but not exactly. It took from a couple, but I think it was most closely modeled after Colorado. And um, someone will correct me, Representative Cordes will co correct me if I'm wrong about that. Great, thank you. Selena. You know, I think um, I had the same question about whether the constitutionality for both um, uh, for both the Defender General and for our own Legislative Council about whether the constitutionality had been challenged elsewhere. And so I think a lot of my questions have been asked, but just um, I guess I'm still, I guess, I think you, you in your response to Representative Malone came clearer, I came clearer to understanding your concerns about the constitutionality. I, I, I just would note my time on this committee, we clarify um, acceptable defenses all the time in our, our you know, maybe not all the time, but it's it's common practice, at least in my time on this committee, to to clarify acceptable defenses. And so I'm I guess I'm just trying to really get understand why um, you feel that's a potentially unconstitutional practice here. And I I think I heard your answer relate to the fact that it's the it's the you know, where it's the defense itself that we would be eliminating and that that, I'm t I guess I'm trying to understand more about your concerns about the constitutionality. Right, so uh, by, by, by prohibiting certain uh, subjects from ever being uh, part of a defendant's defense, right? And, and, and Bryn identified, and, and certainly the, the statute identifies uh, the bill, self-defense, provocation, heat of passion, which come into play in uh, murder cases, right? Um, diminished capacity, insanity. Those are the, the four very, very broad, sweeping, fundamental defenses available to all defendants when accused. And um, to, to prohibit, uh, the ability to raise those uh, facts. Um, again, it's not that you just want that a, that a person would want to just raise them just to raise them. There would have to be a basis to raise them because they are relevant. They're because they are relevant to state of mind, right? Um, Bryn shared earlier that the prosecution has the burden um, in charges to, to present state of mind, intent, right? So the intent will be knowing or specific or purposeful intent to commit the acts alleged, right? The homicide, the assault, whatever it is, this high standard beyond a reasonable doubt that this person at this moment actually intended to do what they did, right? The right, that critical right to present a defense in criminal law is to attack that, that they didn't have, that that person did not have the requisite and essential element as to as to the evil culpable mens rea, such that if you prove it, it goes that it's associated with the appropriate penalty to go to jail, right? And we're talking about offenses that involve the most serious penalties of life imprisonment, right? The highest stakes. Um, to have someone who's accused go in with these, with these serious charges, with the heavy weight of the state behind the prosecution, prosecuting them. And now you now you say you, you these these defenses are available, but not but you cannot uh, you cannot present this defense even if it would otherwise meet the admissibility requirements under our, our rules of evidence, even if it would have withstood adversarial challenges from the prosecution, even if the judge would have found that it would have been admissible, and the jurors would have found it relevant and appropriate, right, to view so they could see and not be denied the full picture of what happened. And we trust our jurors, right, to make those decisions and decide for themselves. And that's why the evidence rules are, are provided and written broadly so that we give every relevant and admissible evidence before the jurors. 
because they are the ultimate truth seekers and truth finders uh, to determine that, that ultimate question, right? Uh, when we start fiddling with what can and can't come in, again, to protect whom? To protect the defendant, certainly not. That goes directly against uh, her, her ability to write to present a defense. To protect the jurors, again, I think that, un that underestimates jurors' ability to, to, even if they come in with their own biases, their own homophobias, that they can't otherwise shelve those and follow the rule of law. I think it also undermines, and, and I think it undermines the public perception and trust of the, of the court system itself. If judges are, uh, hands are tied, that they can't even consider this otherwise relevant evidence because it has been determined by legislation what can and cannot, can't come in. Um, I, think the, I think that the integrity of the, of the system comes into question, right? Uh, that but for this evidence having been considered, this otherwise admissible evidence, um, the person is convicted, right? I think it. I think that these rules. I, I think you're right. You you do consider many things in any given session. I do not think that, and certainly would hope that this committee doesn't tread lightly whenever there are, are these fundamental principles at stake and, and and where these principles, the proposals are to shrink them. Um. Um, yes, just a, a little follow up. I mean, certainly I don't think we do tread lightly and I'll stay for the record. I don't think this bill treads lightly either. I think this is a, a very serious issue. And, um, but I don't, you know, there's nothing in this language that I read that is precluding the underlying defense of, for example, diminished capacity or insanity, those, those, you know, big defenses you just enumerated, it's, it's just making it very clear that, um, that a person, an understanding of a person's gender identity, you know, is not is not a criteria cannot is not an acceptable criteria for those defense, but I don't think it. Um, so it certainly limits, um, you know, the the uh, criteria, but I don't think it it um, eliminates the defense. It's the underlying defenses themselves. It just it just eliminates um, respectfully the the bias the element of bias in constituting them is my reading of it. Um, and you're welcome. You're welcome to comment more if you think I've got that really wrong. No, I, I think I think that in the most general sense, how many ways can um, a case theoretically raise self-defense, considering all the possible facts that could go into an argument of self-defense? I see that as your point, right? This one goes to just one. Right? So how are you doing a categorical ban on self-defense? Right? And I think the, 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 the answer is that, that each case is individual. And each case is individual that in any given case, if this was relevant, if this was relevant to understand the full circumstances of what was going on at the time, right? that that could constitute a wholesale ban of that defense for that person. All relevant evidence, right? All evidence that is probative to proving or disproving the charged offense. That's the relevant evidence. If it, if, because yes, it may, it may be, it may be offensive for most of us, right? What is, involved in terms of motivation of a charged crime, including, um, including you know, hate that is, that is at issue here, including any other hate in another situation. It doesn't eliminate the fact that it is relevant to understand how things what went down on that charged uh, incident. And for the jurors to understand that fully, they need the complete picture for the defendant to be able to have the freedom and not just the freedom, the constitutional right he or she's entitled to, 
to present and mount a complete defense, that's when it constitutes and becomes a categorical ban for that person. Okay. Thank you. Selena, do you have any other follow-up or? Oh, no, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Thank okay. you to the witness. Great. Uh, any other questions for the Defender General's office? And I, I also, um, I invite the, the two sponsors to, um, if you have any questions. Oh, I'm sorry, Kate, I didn't see your hand. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, thank you. I, I was almost hesitant to raise my hand because I don't know that my thoughts are fully formulated. There's a lot of um, legalese talk right now, and sometimes that that gets my head head turned around a little bit. Um, and and I feel like I'm sort of stuck in a little bit of like a cyclical loop in listening to this conversation. So, um, tell me if I'm if I'm getting this wrong. So part of what I'm hearing is that there's a desire to maintain a pathway to bring forward evidence if it is deemed relevant. And part of what I'm hearing is there's all these checks and balances within the court system that would sort of result ultimately in things only being brought forward for evidence if it, if it were uh, truly you know, relevant and appropriate, I guess is the language that I heard. I guess what the cyclical sort of loop I keep getting stuck in is like, okay, so what I'm hearing then is there's a desire to keep an avenue open to move forward with evidence where it's deemed that it's relevant and appropriate to essentially put forward that the person's gender identity was like contributed to the person's actions in that crime that like if it were to even get to that point it's because somehow in that in that court process it was determined that that was relevant and appropriate as some sort of mitigating factor in the crime and i guess and that, it, this is this is sort of genuinely intended as a question and, but like i'm trying to wrap my head around when is it ever relevant or appropriate that someone's gender identity be a defense for a, a crime like i feel like that's part of why this bill is being put forward isn't it to sort of prevent that from being an avenue that we could follow because it you know for me, for many it seems that that is would never be relevant or appropriate that someone's gender identity would be the reason that a crime is committed so i'm just i feel like i'm stuck in a loop a little bit with this and i don't know if anyone can, can help me out of that loop so I, i'll try to take a stab and maybe I'll, I'll try to do it by way of a hypothetical um, and we can we can put whatever we can put whatever um, is the issue. But let's let's have it be that the, the two the two people involved in what later amounts to a charge of some kind of bodily harm uh, assault assault right. Um, but it's a, it's an encounter between two people, two people who are walking down a street and they're the only two people on the street and it's very lonely and some words are exchanged based on a perception of sexual orientation and it's getting hot you know more heated and there is now aggressive physical worries of of, of bodily injury and it's being borne out because now the the space between the two people are shrinking and there's still more and more of an exchange um, of, of heated words, of hateful words based on perception of, of gender identity. And now it is so close that that person is worried that the other person is going to hit them and in fact hits them. And they're the only ones alone. And so they hit them back because now they fear that they're about to be killed. They're about to, to, be, to be severely injured and pounded because 
of what they perceive their aggressor's sexual identity is or perception and how the two are en encountering and engaging with each other based on it. So it's not just necessarily the complainant's gender identity we're talking about. It's about the differences in gender identity be between these two people that is the cause of it. Now let's not assume who has and is of, of sort of from the marginalized group to the, to us, you know, sort of an, Let's 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 assume the defendant is from someone who's from a, mar a traditionally marginalized community, and acts out in self-defense, um, based on the perception of what that complainant's gender identity is. So now we have two people who have been harmed and hurt, and the police arrive and arrest one of them and only charge one of them with, as the aggressor, and it goes to trial. And the whole case is who did it, who initiated it, who's responsible, who should have backed down, who acted in self-defense, right? Those are where if we, if the, if the evidence is presented or the, the proffered evidence is presented um, by the defendant to show that it was actually self-defense, that, that he or she acted in self-defense that day. And if, and, and it's relevant that the perception that he faced imminent harm was because of the gender identity, perceived gender identity of the aggressor, he thinks is the aggressor, the complainant, right? That becomes relevant, absolutely relevant in terms of how to present that self-defense. The whole case and that whole case of that person rests on the self-defense. Again, it doesn't just come in because you wanted to, uh, you have to present the case. You got to you got to the judge, and it has to meet all of these check boxes on what is required for for that particular defense before it comes in. I don't know if that's helpful. I can keep working on on, on making it clear. So I, I appreciate the the real life example. I guess I'm curious, given that example in this particular bill, it says a nonviolent romantic or sexual advance. I think you know in the example you just used, it was a ultimately a violent one. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, just looking at this particular bill, you know, would the language within this bill essentially protect you from the kind of example that you're describing? And just to clarify, are you talking about part B, 6566B? Yeah, thanks. Uh, line 11 on the version I have, B. Shall not be used to mitigate the severity of defense. I, and I might have missed this in, in Bryn's walkthrough. I read that as a sentencing, as a sentencing aspect, mitigating the severity of offense, um, severity of offense, the penalty, the sentence can't be used to argue during a sentencing stage of a case, not the proof of, of proof of the case, not you know after someone has been found guilty. Now you move to the sentencing and, and if it's a contested sentencing, the defendant can present evidence to the judge seeking mitigation um, because there's a range of possible penalties, right? And the argument being, you know, don't sentence me on the higher end because it's mitigated by these other factors. That's how I read V. So that's a separate part from what we've just been talking about. The issues as to the categorical bans on certain defenses, that goes to the, to the merits part of it, the, the trial itself. Um, that's where the right to present a defense comes in and is the core, um, core issue at stake there. Thank you. Okay. Uh... Let's see, Celine, I had seen your hand up before. Is it, was that from before? Uh, it was new, but Representative Donnelly went straight to my question about the, um, the limitation of this provision to not violent encounter. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions for the Defender General's office? Okay. Oh, Bob, go ahead. Let me unmute. I don't know if you see that hand in time, Maxine. <clears throat> Rebecca, so 
for for clarification for my purposes only here, I guess. So is it your stance that your office uh, opposes the entire bill or just certain aspects of the bill, certain sections of the bill? No, no, the, the entire bill. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Let's take a 15 minute break and then we'll come back and um, finish up with the testimony. Thank you. Mm -hmm.